welcome to another episode of The Brave Front, the men's mental health podcast that combines inspiring stories with insightful expertise. My name is Tim Bainan, and if you haven't done so already, please give us a follow on whatever platform you're listening to us on. Every follow or review helps other people to find the show and, hopefully, to benefit from the amazing stories and advice that our guests have to share. And, talking of amazing guests, here's what's coming up from this episode guest in the next hour. So if you just broadly say, well, this happened because of toxic masculinity, you're, as a man, you're just going to hear, I'm, I'm toxic. Men require far more psychological safety than, than women to start talking about their mental health. You know, as girls, we are taught from day dot to be introspective, to socialise with other people, to lean into the sisterhood. Whereas, unfortunately, from a very, very young age, boys are taught that it's boys v boys, men v men, that it's dog eat dog. It's a bit of a bugbear for me, for example, when people say, oh, men need to talk more. And don't get me wrong, they do. The evidence is telling us that they they don't talk as much as women. You're not socialised to. Um, however, my argument to that is, but if you keep telling men to talk and you're not teaching other men and society how to listen and to do, to know what to do with that information, you might as well just tell them to suck it up and man up and, and just not bother because your responses can be just as harmful as not saying anything. That was the voice of Tony White, a men's mental health consultant, writer and speaker who specialises in workplace mental health and in supporting men who work for our uniformed services. Running a website with the memorable mission statement, Mental Health Without the Bullshit, Tony blends rigorous academic and clinical research with a quite literal hands-on approach to support. Helping men who often feel they have nowhere else to turn, their experiences working with hundreds of clients on a one-to-one basis have given her a first-hand, third-person insight into the reality of what it means to be a man in the UK today. So it was fascinating to sit down with Tony to delve into the subject of masculinity, banter and bravado, and to explore some of the obvious and not so obvious barriers that are still holding men back from addressing the kind of mental health issues that sadly for some can leave them contemplating the loneliest decision of all. Tony, thank you for joining us. Great to see you. Lovely to have you on, on the Brave Front today. How are you and where do we find you today? Oh, you find me snuggled up in the warm. <laughs> um, it's getting a bit brisk out there for this time of year, but um, no, nice and warm and and grateful to be warm because there's a lot of people at this time of year that, that can't be. Yeah, indeed. And then talking of being warm, I was kind of expecting to see you with a hot chocolate in hand. Looking at your Twitter, you look like you're a bit of a know, hot chocolate efficient. No, those are my, um, you know, those memes that say, don't talk to me until you've had the morning coffee. It's... Yeah. Don't talk to me until I've had my morning hot chocolate. Um, and then after that, the gremlin goes um, and I'm I'm sociable after that. But <laughs> no, normally I have so much sugar in the morning that that carries me on for the rest of the day. <laughs> How powers you through? Powers you through. I must say, they look like works of art, your hot chocolate. They are, they are impressive. I will just say, don't open the middle drawer of my desk at work um, because it does look like Willy Wonka threw up in there. <laughs> Okay. But it's amazing. Excellent. Excellent. I think we all need one of those drawers, definitely. Um, <laughs> so tell me a bit about, about you and tell me sort of why and how you've you've ended up becoming a bit of a, a specialist in, in men's mental health. Yeah, so it actually came about, I've always had an interest in mental health um, and I've been a peer supporter in some variety and capacity since I was about 16, supporting other people at school who came from difficult backgrounds. So I've always had an interest, had lived experience with it. But it wasn't until I moved to Australia and I became friends with a couple of guys in Bondi that were running their own mental health initiative. And I really started to look into the suicide rate and I, I realized how ignorant I'd been. And actually, I realized that in a in a lot of the Western countries, the male suicide rate is sitting around about 75%, give or take a few. And so I really started to look into, okay, well, why? What's different? And it was the same kind of issues that were coming up. There was lots of alcoholism, lots of emotional stoicism, all these kind of things, you know, the men don't talk and and blah, blah, blah. And 
I really then started my journey of kind of continual education. And so I've been doing that since I was mm, probably since about 2014, really starting to just focus on men. And it wasn't until I actually came back and I connected with police as a victim of serious crime that I then all of a sudden had people coming to my social media realizing that I was specializing in men's mental health and looking at organized national well-being how men's mental health applies in an organization what it is it what is it about a workplace that can help or hinder because when I came back from Australia I started working in a law firm and because of my role I ended up having lots of contact points with a lot of different people in the workplace and ended up being a confidant for a lot of men. And I'm thinking, what is going on? It's middle-aged men. They've got very similar issues. And after I connected with police, my reputation just went wild. I had dozens of men contacting me, mainly with police. And then slowly I started to have fire, ambulance, military, all talking to me about how they were feeling or they knew they were feeling something but couldn't quite articulate or name it for themselves. Really just desperately lonely and isolated despite being surrounded by friends, good colleagues, stable job. And and it, it really hasn't stopped since then. It, it's been mm. hundreds of men that I've supported now since 2018 when I connected with police. And I now have this kind of tripped and fell into a national reputation for supporting men. So I do support women in uniform services as well, but it's predominantly men. And, and I've ended up specialising in the uniform sector. The fascinating area to to specialise in. Obviously, I know a little bit about it myself. Working working for the firefighters charity. Um, what, what is it you think? And it's interesting also that you say that this is a a uh, an international uh, issue, and and so men across the world suffering uh, in the same way and with the, for the same reasons. In terms of in terms of those emergency responders and in terms of those uniformed services, what is it do you think about those roles in particular that uh, that either exacerbate those issues that men have? Or, or you know, men are just perhaps struggling more in those roles. What, why, what do you think it is specifically about the uniform services? There's a bit of a mix, really. Um, I think what you get is this clash of what we view as masculinity, which is changing, and it's why we're seeing a lot of male leaders in this space saying that masculinity is in crisis. Um, and there are certain parts of it that are worsening; some are improving. But, but my personal view is a lot of the reason why we say it's in crisis is actually because the definition is falling apart. It, it's changing, it's evolving. And so therefore, you know, the 1950s, you had you got a wife, you had a, a stable job, even if it was working in coal mines, working awful hours, you barely saw your wife and children, you were the provider. And actually now we're realizing a lot of those aspects of quote traditional masculinity aren't necessarily needed anymore we don't need you to go down the coal mines you're not going to be in fight or flight mode if you're working in the office um and so you've got this real mix of society still viewing men as needing to be providers you know the emotional stoic out of a, a heterosexual couple for example you know be a provider to your your wife your female partner be uh, a solid father figure to your children, you know, and so we're still, as much as we're breaking away from that traditional mould, we are still upholding it. Um, if you look at the fact, you know, if you've got two parents named at a school, for example, they'll nearly always call the mum first when a child is sick. Even if a dad has said, please call me first, I've got more availability, they will still call mum. So there is still this up, uh, upholding of viewing the men as the financial provider, the one that gives a home, but isn't necessarily the emotional provider. And so you have society basically telling men, you have to be strong, you cannot be vulnerable. Vulnerability is not strength, um, it's a weakness. And you you get this, we often say, those of us that work in the space, that masculinity is hard won, but easily lost. So if you think about the jokes in the pub about, oh, you've lost your man card, because you've got to call your wife and tell her when you're coming home and and these kind of jokes. And so you've got this really, really defined model of masculinity, which is breaking away. And that's not to say that masculinity is toxic and that there's not fantastic parts of that traditional masculinity. But you've got that breaking away, clashing with this more 
emotionally available and emotionally intelligent society. So there's a real issue of men not really knowing their place anymore. You know, if women don't need me, who's going to need me? I'm not needed, you know, and that is in part because as women now, we do have financial independence. We can get credit cards, mortgage and all that kind of thing. So you've got this issue of masculinity and I can't tell other men because what if they think I'm not so manly anymore? And you have this real fear and it's not to be downplayed that it that fear can quite literally kill a man if he takes his life. So you've got all this going on with masculinity and then you have this severe trauma of their roles in, in uniform services, um, which will differ. Um, certainly in the fire, you're going to be going out a lot and you're going to see, smell, feel, hear horrific things that, that people won't necessarily do. And then they'll go into that protective mode again where they might not want to tell their colleagues because they fear, oh, they're going to think I'm less of a man. They can cope. Why can't I? But then you've also got the fact that they want to protect their families from the emotional scarring of what their job is doing to them. So actually, you've got a workplace and society that doesn't necessarily, and we are getting better, but it doesn't necessarily allow easy disclosures. And and, and a lot of men aren't comfortable with those disclosures, even if they want to be. And then you've got this mix of but I also can't tell my family because I want to shield them. I don't want to tell them what I see and experience. And so all of a sudden, they've got all these people they could potentially talk to and they don't talk to anyone because they fear all these different things coming from every angle. It's that thing of being, you know, uh, that saying you can be in a crowded room full of people and still the loneliest one there. And so you've got this real clash, unfortunately, of the trauma of their job and this unconscious kind of rule book of what masculinity should look like. And certainly in uniform, that perpetuates that big, strong man, that knight in shining armour. And and actually, therefore, they have no opportunity, they feel, often to take that armour off and be vulnerable. Gosh, I mean, there's, there's so much to unpick there, isn't there, in terms of, in, in terms of the issues that that you've covered. I mean, I'm fascinated by the whole issues around and the, 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 those competing narratives around masculinity in, in society and there's different messages that, that men get. And do you feel those are exacerbated by by what by the media and by some of the some of the ways that men are portrayed? We constantly hear the term toxic masculinity uh, a, a lot used over and over again. Do you think that's another competing narrative that people that men men struggle to 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 sort of get their own heads around as well? I think there is there's a real problem at the moment is that actually it, it's we are correctly as now women having these voices and identifying parts of masculinity and parts of our patriarchal society that absolutely need to be to be rid of and it's really important but but a lot of people use the term toxic masculinity in very very broad circumstances and actually it needs to be used very not delicately, but specifically. So if you just broadly say, well, this happened because of toxic masculinity, it, you're, as a man, you're just going to hear, I'm I'm toxic. And unfortunately, as I said, because we're having this change, you know, of what defines a man and what masculinity might look like, what do we do when we're unsure? We cling on to what we know. So actually, I, I do believe that one of the reasons why we are seeing a rise in male violence is actually because we are this definition of of what a man should be is crumbling. We can't define it because it is so fluid. Gender is so fluid. You know what a man and woman can do these days in society is so so different. And so actually, that, that going back to what we what we think of as a man as that traditional masculinity: be strong, be silent you know, be everybody else's protector. Uh, we cling on to that violently sometimes and, and we all get defensive when we feel we're being attacked. And so I do think that it's really, really important that we are having this conversation as a society about, you know, toxic masculinity which harms men, you know, so, so much themselves because it is in part why a lot of men don't feel that they can talk even if they want to. I, I do think that we're also not doing enough to highlight some of the systemic issues 
that are preventing men from talking, such as it, it's a bit of a bugbear for me, for example, when people say, oh, men need to talk more. And don't get me wrong, they do. The evidence is telling us that they, they don't talk as much as women. You're not socialized to. Um, however, my argument to that is, but if you keep telling men to talk and you're not teaching other men and society how to listen and to do, to know what to do with that information, you might as well just tell them to suck it up and man up and, and just not bother because your responses can be just as harmful as not saying anything. That's, that's, that's interesting because it is something you hear a lot, isn't it, about just that general that general uh, encouragement of men, men to talk. So I understand that. Do, do you think there's any you know, progress at all that has been made looking, looking at uh, the way society has changed over over recent years, we've moved away from that kind of lad culture that seemed to be dominant in the nineties and early early two thousands, yeah. especially, and that seems to have that seems to have faded away. And there is a much more sort of much more discussion in the media now about men's mental health. There's much more talk about yeah. it, uh, and and more organisations and charities are working in that space, which is a good thing. Do you think that that's that is making inroads at all into into men's consciousness consciousnesses? Or do you think that's still, uh, you know, just a small drop in the in the ocean? Oh, look, when you look at the statistics of mental health for men, you look at the suicide rates, it's absolutely a drop in the ocean. Um, but what are they, you know, every ripple starts from a drop. And if you think we've only really been talking about it as a society probably in the last five years, you know, when Calm, which is Campaign Against Living Miserably, started doing, you know, viral campaigns it really in, in britain i probably say when the british rapper professor green came out and talked about his father's suicide and actually he was one of the first ambassadors for calm and doing documentaries so we're, we're doing so much more and we are really really getting there my kind of issue is a lot of the time and and why i focus on men's mental health in the workplace is because we are getting into male dominated spaces such as you know there's great campaigns in um, rugby in football uh, you know several charities will have coasters in the pubs but actually I know a lot of men that don't like any of that or they watch football at home or rugby at home so how are you going to get to them you know if if you've got those messages and they're sat on the TV in the in the lounge with their family, uh, how how are you going to reach them there? Which is, you know, really, again, as we're coming back to the the man being the provider, needing to work, um, actually, therefore, the workplace is, is one of the best and certainly in uniform to get the message to them that you, you can talk and there are safe avenues to do it. So let, let's explore that whole workplace uh, environment a little bit in terms of some of the barriers that you feel are holding men back, especially in those sort of work, those male dominated work, workplace environments and of which a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the uniform services are certainly in, in, certainly in fire. Well, what do you think, I, I hear talking to firefighters a lot, but they find, they often find strength in that sort of band of brothers mentality that comes with, comes with the role. But at the same time, I also hear sometimes that they don't feel they can talk to their workmates about some of the things that are really on their minds. They'll have they'll banter about it, they'll laugh about yeah. it, they'll share jokes and dark humor about it. But mm -hmm. then they'll go away and they'll 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 lose themselves in their own inner thoughts away from that environment. So, what are some of those barriers that are actually stopping men from from making real progress in there? I think a lot of it is unfortunately because it is male dominated. So there was a, there was actually a fascinating review by the Harvard Business Review that, that kind of said that you know there's the more male dominated a workplace is, the more potential for toxic behaviour, so more bullying, you know, poor mental health, people high turnovers, and it really is this case of you know the masculine norms again like show no weakness strength and stamina put your work first dog eat dog and unfortunately even the men with the best intentions will cave to that peer pressure you know we talk about peer pressure as teenagers that doesn't go away as as adults that that becomes cultural norms and 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 socialization um and this is why i say it, it's really easy to tell men to talk but if you're not looking at those barriers to, to their help seeking and helping break them down, it, it, it's a wasted campaign poster on a toilet door. So a lot of the time with men, you will find that they'll do the superficial, as you said, the banter, 
but actually they're worried about losing those man points again so they'll laugh it off and I, and I call that something called truth and deflect so you'll normally get it in that banter scenario um, and the example I use is if you walk down the street and you bumped into your friend Steve and you'd be like Steve I haven't seen you for, for ages mate how you doing shake hands in the street and he says oh you know I've had a shit few months but I'm, I'm doing better now what he's done there is he's given you his truth by saying he's had a difficult few months but he's instantly deflected by saying but I'm better now so really it's it's really important that you hear that truth first and go I'm really sorry you've had a a difficult few months mate is there anything you know do you want to catch up like talk about it and that's not to say he will but it's those moments that actually if you learn how to listen to men's banter you will realize that they're talking all the time Mm. all the time about their mental health but certainly but they're, in, but they're masking it under un, the masking it with dark humor, or they're mm-hmm. masking it with but with banter, basically. Yeah, and dark humor is a fantastic tool, but like anything, a, a tool can be for both benefit and and harm. And if you use it too much to to distract yourself from how you're feeling, that's when you start really stuffing things in to a, a suitcase that you want to stick up in the attic and you don't address it. But you can start listening to banter. For example, I'll I'll share some WhatsApp messages and that night or whenever he's messaging me, he might put lots of laughing emojis and and funny emojis and GIFs and things like that. And I'll play along for a bit and then I'll cut the bullshit and just say, dark humour aside, I am here if you want to to talk anytime. Like, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm not doing so well. So you can call them out on the bullshit. You can uphold it, but then you can pull them quietly to the side. But it, it's, as you said, certainly in the fire service, you will stand down together. You'll debrief, you'll stand down together. You can rest. Um, so you do have that band of brothers, but there's always that fear of shame and being ridiculed. Um, and certainly when you know, you're looking into a hierarchical organisation, which unfortunately uniforms are, if you're looking to progress, that is unfortunately still seen as a weakness. If you went into an interview, for example, and said, oh, actually, I had time off for mental health. And I would see that as a strength. And and I am seeing more people recognise it to say, actually, that's good. You took, you recognise you weren't doing so well. You took a month off. You got some counselling. But it's disingenuous to say that open discussions of mental health in the workplace will not harm your career. We want to encourage it, but we must do it with a caveat that it might not always go the way that you want. And certainly, I mean, I, I've spoken to, I've supported lots of different people going up through the ranks, right up to sort of chief constables in police. And I will always say because often you'll get someone like that if you've got a mental health event and you'll get one of the big bosses will come out and open it and say how important mental health is. And I was at an, I was at an event and I asked to speak to an assistant chief constable afterwards. And I said, can I ask you a question about your mental health journey, which he'd been open about? And I said, were you public about this as you were going through the ranks? He was like, no. Because often you'll find that the leading men that come out about their mental health and about how the fact that maybe they were a quasi-functional alcoholic or they were suicidal is often when they're in positions of career safety. It's yeah. not when they're going up. So again, it, it's really important that we give men the choice and say, you don't just have to be open about it as a, as a team, as a section, and talk about it in a group. You can go off quietly you yeah. can seek your own counseling so we you know it is important that we tap that, that that we encourage men to talk but we also must recognize that like anybody some are shy some just want to be discreet you know some don't want to go past the banter with their mates they want to talk about it properly and it's about giving them that that choice but certainly in you know in uniform services you've got those barriers of trying to progress through the ranks um, and always that dog eat dog you know and unfortunately the organizations themselves can be very dog eat dog you know toxic and everybody's out for themselves um and i often say that uniform services tends to be the nut- and you know we use this word overly 
in society, but narcissistic. But I'm talking about we're all narcissistic to a point. That's our ego. But when you go to the extremes, when you're talking about power, so you've got hierarchical organizations that nurture the power. So you've got the narcissists that are going to go through their, you know, boards, they're going to interview, they want promotions, and they do not care who they leave in their wake. You know, they will step over everybody. And then you've got the empaths who really do care about their roles, their teams, their communities. And so actually you'll find that it's the empaths that will um, struggle. And we're seeing this in studies, you know, that actually a, a big part of your personality defines, can define how unwell you are. Um, so there was a great quote um, that I read about a study that they did in Greece and it said, narcissists are really ha happy people because they are, because they don't have the <laughs> conscience. So they're the happy yeah. people. And it's the other people that go into therapy because of them. Yeah. So they should yeah. be in therapy, but we have to receive the consequences of, you know, so um, the narcissists are happy, but everyone else is miserable, but they don't care. And so you've got this real you know, dichotomy of the two constantly fighting. Um, and so unfortunately, it will be the empaths who eventually burn out, will get, you know, PTSD, maybe complex PTSD. Also, we're now seeing uh, post-traumatic embitterment disorder, which is similar to PTSD, but it's more about organisational injustice when, when people haven't been moral in the organisation. So there's, we're now seeing in uniform services that actually the organizations themselves are more detrimental to your mental health than the roles that you do. Right. Um, and even in policing, they actually found that men were more likely to have PTSD. And again, that comes back to that suppression of emotion and just being like, oh, I just need to suck it up and get on with it. And eventually, you know, it bursts and they hit crisis mode. Well, I mean, there's, there's there's a lot there's a lot there, in, in terms of uh, the complexities of the workplace, and, and it's fascinating to hear you talk. Right. I'm I'm interested as well in terms of, given all those issues in in the workplace and all those things that are stopping men from 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 talking in in that environment, how does that all manifest itself at home? Then, how, what happens as a result when when guys go home? Uh, I often hear from from uh, uh, we heard we hear from you know families of, of men who died by suicide in the fire service sometimes that they're the last people to mm. know they had no idea they didn't know their yeah. their, their um, part, husbands or, or partners were were feeling that way are they are men hiding it just as much at home as they are in the workplace they can do unfortunately as I said earlier they there is no real safe space in black and white terms because. As I said, if you they they're terrified of sharing it at work in case it comes to career consequences, and, and don't forget we're training a lot of men in uniform to be professionally paranoid. So you can have the nicest team, but you're still going to think that the minute I talk to you, you're going to tell a line manager, uh, a watch commander, um, and so they're professionally par paranoid. So they don't talk at work, or they will do it on a so professional basis, as, as you said earlier. And then they don't want to burden their family. Um, and I hear that a lot with the men that, that speak to me going, oh, have you got time to talk? I don't want to be a burden. I'm like, you're never a burden. None of that talk, you're not a burden. But you'd be amazed at how many men have such low self-worth for all the bravado, for all the banter. Um, they don't feel that they deserve help. They don't feel that they can be helped. They, they, they don't know where to go for help. And so they don't want to put that on their family, but they also don't feel that they can talk to their colleagues. So at home, you tend to have in uniform services something that I found is the two extremes. You'll either have the man who will mask everything or all of a sudden he'll just decline and his uh, and his wife will suddenly realise that actually they need to get to the GP the next day. And unfortunately, as m whenever I educate men and I talk about barriers to help seeking and and maybe some signs that they're struggling, I always say it with a caveat that sometimes there are no signs, and that's not a failure on the people around them. There might be some very very minute signs that someone very well trained could spot, but that's a big could a big if and actually if you're not trained how are you going to find those micro signs 
And so as much as I will always say, here's a list that you might be able to identify one of your colleagues is struggling, it's also not your fault. Yeah, it's um, not that simple, is it? It's, it's no. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, not, eh? yeah it's, it's sometimes there's just no, there's, it, it, you know, these people, these people we talk to who who have lost colleagues, especially, and, and and they say that they always say, "Oh, we wish we'd asked him," but then they had no reason to because he didn't no. he didn't present anything that suggested to them that he was struggling. And um, um, also, so they have this. Yeah, doesn't mean that they tell you that that's unfortunately mm. the issue that we have is that you can ask and ask and ask and ask. But ultimately, unless you catch them in crisis mode where they haven't got the, the energy to put that mask on, you, you might not see it. You know, you might see it at home. They become more irritable. They might, you know, one of the ways I say to men is that they start withdrawing on communication. So they might be really slow to answer your texts or they don't answer your calls or they make plans and cancel, or they just decline social invites, you know, but then his wife might start to see that actually maybe they're not having great sex or sex at all anymore. They don't cuddle, perhaps, you know, they have, they're very quick to anger, very irritable. But again, you know, you could go on and give about 20 symptoms that might show that someone that a man is struggling and therefore you need to ask him or you need to see if there's some support available but ultimately sometimes that the, there really is no sign or perhaps there was a historic issue with depression but he hasn't talked about it for a while and then all of a sudden bang he's dead by suicide um and it's like oh I should have asked but but, but sometimes you you can't you know for all the science for all the evidence for all the education we can do sometimes very sadly that there are absolutely no signs and and whilst people will naturally are, are going to feel guilty because they're empathetic and and they're grieving you know i think a lot of people with suicide grief feel they have no right to be angry um because oh well you know i can't be angry because he was in pain it's like well you can scream and rant and you know he left and you're here and you're stuck with your grief. You're allowed to be angry. You're allowed to call him selfish. It's your grief. And um, that doesn't mean that you don't miss the hell out of him. But it is really important to recognize that we are humans um, and, you know, we can't be with people 24-7 and, and read their minds. Well, of course. Given given that, you know, we, we see these issues of men talking in the workplace, men talking at home. What do you find in in uh, in, in a therapy environment, in a one to one environment w- with yourself? What's happening then when when you give men the space and the opportunity to talk? What are you what are you seeing uh, in in those situations? I tend to get their vulnerability a lot, so I will hear or see them cry. Uh, they'll often do this thing where you can see them welling up and they can feel it, and then they'll turn their head away because they still can't give that vulnerability and you know don't get me wrong I can take the piss out of them like anybody can and I swear like an absolute trooper and I have trauma so I use dark humor as well but also I'm incredibly feminine I call them sweetheart you know no matter what rank and and what have you and so actually I give them a hug and and we'll just talk in general I'm not here saying what's going on tell me but Normally, if you just give them space and you just talk and you you build up their trust, because I do find that men require far more psychological safety than than women to start talking about their mental health. You know, as girls, we are taught from day dot to be introspective, to socialize with other people, to lean into the sisterhood um, anytime, you know, whether it's a stranger and you know, you're out on a date with a guy that's making you feel uncomfortable and you just go up to another woman and say, oh, hi, it's nice to meet you. You know, we don't know the woman, but we're taught that. Whereas, unfortunately, from a very, very young age, boys are taught that it's boys v boys, men v men, that it's dog eat dog. And so actually what I do find is that I will get their vulnerability, which is why I know that men do talk and they want to talk, but it's about giving them the space and you know, 
as I said, sometimes they'll they'll speak to me and they'll talk about the issue, but in quite lighthearted manner. They want a bit of a laugh. They just want to rant maybe. But then other times they want that deep and meaningful. And it, it's just about amending what they need and reacting accordingly. Um, there's no point in me going in bull in a china shop. If they don't want to talk about something, I, I'm not going to force them to. But I do think that men require far more softness than society says that you do. And that does blankets or anything like that. But one of the reasons I'm becoming a touch therapist, which is essentially a professional cuddler, which is so American. And <laughs> so funny. But it's because so many men are touch starved. And and so many men are conditioned that the only way that they get that affection, that intimacy, is through a sexual partner. And and so unfortunately, if if you don't have that, if you're not having a great marriage at home, it's stale, you're both fighting, actually he needs a good hug and he just needs to let it out. But also one of the reasons I get their vulnerability is because I'm not their partner. Mm-hmm. So again, they can be vulnerable with me because I'm not in their home. There's still some distance. Mm-hmm. So it's just about recognizing that actually, you know, they can be vulnerable, but it's often because they struggle talking to their female partners because they fear being judged, ridiculed, not being seen as the provider, not being seen as emotionally stoic. So there, there is a real kind of middle ground that I sit into. Yeah. But yeah. Men, men will be vulnerable with me and they'll cry and they'll have a panic attack and they'll talk to me about being suicidal because I, I, I don't report any uniform services men for being suicidal. I, I'm not obliged to because I'm not part of a counselling body, for example. But it's also because in almost every other avenue, there is a duty for that person that they disclose to to report. And so if you keep shutting down avenues to disclose they won't disclose and you'll have no opportunity to prevent it what are men like at the end of a session compared to when they come into a session how how what kind of difference in the state of mind and in their emotional well-being are you seeing once they've been given the opportunity with you to 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 talk to to open up to to cuddle to to you know to express emotions that they might have bottled up for however long they've been bottling up it up for what does that result in? What what does what kind of effect does that have on on men when they when they leave your your surgery? Usually exhausted, <laughs> um, because it is emotionally exhausting talking about really difficult things. But ultimately, they feel lighter. That's not to say that I have fixed them magically, um, because I I will never say that I fix them. But normally, it's just like that pressure valve. You just need to take take it out, let the steam off a bit. So even if we're sat in a pub and we're talking around the issue, it just reinforces that there is someone there. And, you know, if they want to go for a walk and talk with a dog, that's fine. And again, it's about not putting them in that counsellor's room. You know, I'm not a counsellor, I'm a peer. I do have clinical knowledge, but I, I don't, I can meet them wherever. You know, we can go for a coffee we can chat and actually getting them out into an informal environment really helps but normally that they are they have a headache if if they've had quite you know an outpouring of emotion they can have headaches um, and they're and they're wiped out but they they do feel better for being heard and and a lot of the time that's really what counseling is what good counseling is and um, if you find a good therapist it's about being heard and validated and that's what I do. You know, I don't mock them. I don't dismiss what they're going through. I don't minimise, you know, if they're, you know, I've had men that have unfortunately had affairs and been caught out. And they'll, you know, they'll I'll say, oh, am I a bastard? I'm like, mm, you probably could have done that a bit differently. However, this is the situation. I'm still going to be here. You know, life is not cookie cutter, black and white. And it's just about being someone stable that they can come back to. So sometimes I might do some really intense work when they're really suicidal and then they'll go off again when they're feeling a bit better. And then in six months time, they'll message and say, oh, I'm having dark thoughts again. I'm like, okay. So it's just about being, it's about being stable. It's just about being consistent and just letting them know that they've got an anchor. 
Yeah, I think that's that's really important. Having that point, basically, basically, we just need an army of you, don't we? We need, we need an army of Tonys around the country to help help men when they need, when they need to talk. I would like to, yeah, if I could, <laughs> <laughs> um, if I could clone myself and then take myself on a hot chocolate tour of the country, I would. That sounds like a good plan. That sounds like a good plan. Um, okay, so so what's what's for men listening to this who perhaps maybe maybe even in sort of denial themselves that they've got any issues or that they could they, they they you know they might they might be bottling things up for a while they might be struggling but they might be uh, either unsure of, of what to do next or even in denial themselves as to you know the very fact that they've got an issue what are the things they should recognize in themselves what are the what are the points they should recognize in terms of you know thinking you know helping them to recognize that actually they might need to reach out to somebody uh, for some for some support so certainly in uniform services um one of the things is a decrease in risk aversion so if they're starting to make questionable calls that perhaps they wouldn't have, or they've done something quite reactively and gone, well, oh, that turned out well, but that could have really not been a good situation. Um, so you will see that just risk aversion because they don't they don't care, you know, subconsciously they don't care if they walk out in front of a truck, you know, and so you might see in, increase then in risk taking behaviour. So they might start drinking more, they might gamble. They might um, start shopping past their financial means, things that they recognize don't feel good when they do it and go, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. And they do it. Um, or, you know, one of the classics is unfortunately having affairs. And then you might have, you know, late to shift or making simple mistakes. One of the big ones, actually, which a lot of men believe means that they're better after they've been through a period of, of high distress is actually emotional numbness. So they think when they go from high distress and thinking oh, I'm suicidal and then they come down to that emotional numbness, I'll say, oh, well, how are you feeling? They're like, oh, I'm better. You know, I don't really feel anything. And I'm like, mm, that's not better. That's just a different version of shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you might find that emotional um, numbness, the self-sabotaging behavior, again, with the risk-taking affairs, the obvious one being difficulty sleeping. Um, so you might have insomnia where you struggle to sleep or you might have something called maintenance insomnia where you might wake up at a certain time every time every night but obviously certainly in uniform you're working on shift so it is hard it's slightly better in fire because you can stand down um and get some you know rest when you haven't got calls but you might have nightmares something like we spoke about earlier which is that increase in anger in irritability like you have no resilience you know the second i don't know Steve in the station forgets to put the lid on the milk and suddenly you feel like the Hulk and picking the fridge up because you're so wound up. Yeah. Um, something a lot of men don't talk about in, in general is a change in sexual libido. So you might have two ways. You might, as I said, have that kind of self-sabotaging behavior. So you might all of a sudden become the ladies man, start having affairs um, and you want more sex all the time or you start watching porn more. Or you can go the opposite way, where you just have no libido whatsoever, and your wife might want sex, and you're just never in the mood, or you do you do it, and you don't really want to. And so again, problems with appetite, exercising, exercising is a big thing in uniform because you have to be physically fit to do your job. But you know, that doesn't mean that you're going to find it enjoyable all the time. So if it starts feeling a real struggle, you know, if you're not eating well or you're not eating enough or too much, you know, these things are gonna coincide but exercising actually something i see in uniform services is it does become a self-sabotaging behavior because a lot of men have that solution mindset i've got this problem this is the solution therefore it will fix me mm -hmm. so you know they'll put all their focus in going to the gym and going right i'm going to give up drinking going to give up smoking and then they get a peloton they start becoming a man in lycra. They're on the bike all the time. And then actually you, you start dipping into self-sabotaging behaviors because unfortunately, both fortunately and unfortunately, you, you can see gains when you exercise. Mm -hmm. Weight loss, muscle gain, you might look leaner, you might feel better. And then people will start to congratulate you going, oh, Tim, you're looking amazing these days. And that reinforces the idea that you've got to keep it up. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are seeing that for a lot of men actually that 
the gym can be a really healthy behavior or exercise, but also it can be very harmful because it could be the second you have a problem, I need to go to the gym. Yeah. Instead of processing the problem and dealing with it, it's like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go on the bike. That's that's fascinating because so, we, we, yeah, that's really interesting because I, I, I've, I've looked a lot into this and because I, I, um, you know, my way of getting through sort of my mental health issues when I was diagnosed with cancer and I went through all, all the treatment that I went through, my my go-to crutch was running. So I ran an awful lot. I ran, I've always run and I, I just sort of threw myself into it and, and what have you. So I used that and it, it definitely helped my mental health. But I also I was very lucky to have a very supportive wife who I could talk to and I did talk to a lot about what was going on as well. So I did have that outlet to talk as well. So, but it's fascinating to hear that, you know, for me, that exercise was a real positive in terms of my mental health, but I can see clearly from what you're saying, how it can also be a, a destructive thing because you end up throwing yourself into that and not actually addressing the thing you should be addressing. So, so I can see how it works on both sides. Really interesting. Yeah. You get a distraction and a reward because you're looking good and people are congratulating you. But for me, if I'm seeing a sudden change in that, I, I'm viewing that as a risk factor. So, so as much as I say, you know, these are the things that you can look at for yourself, you know, that kind of identity crisis and, you know, that real self-worth and you've got no self-esteem, you can recognize all that. But I do say that there are risk factors that you as people around that man can identify. You know, for example, if, if he comes into the station, he says, oh, me and my missus are getting divorced. You're like, right, that's significant risk factor for suicide we need to be creating support network around them doing what we can so even though we can't necessarily see something we can still go oh that's that is a risky factor and and actually single men are are the worst for suicide rates um whether that's by divorce widow just being a bachelor and so actually when you have these certain life situations you know even becoming a father so you're you're suicide risk increases to approximately 42 times in the first year post-birth. Now, wow. logically, but that's a really positive thing. You become a father. But if he's got low self-worth and feels undeserving of his partner, he's going to feel undeserving of being a good dad or maybe he didn't have a good dad. And then all of a sudden, that he's gone because you know we're not looking after men's mental health post-birth because we're focusing on mum. So yeah. actually, it's sometimes, you know, even the positives, if they're due to retire or resign, go, oh, but that's their choice. I'm like, yeah, but look what they're leaving behind. Mm. That brotherhood, that stability, that discipline, they're going to lose all that if they don't have something similar to look forward to when they retire. So there are internal things that men can realize that perhaps they're not feeling great. I talked before about passive suicidality um, on Twitter, which... A, a lot of men have and they talk to me about it and I say you do realize you're suicidal I'm not um, and it, it comes back to that lack of risk aversion so you know going to sleep and thinking I don't care if I wake up or mm -hmm. getting into a car for example for that drive home after a really busy shift and he'll think oh, I don't even care if I crash the car mm -hmm. you know or if you get you know uh, uh, unwell I, I've had you know and forgive me I've had men that have said uh, oh, I, I'm being investigated for cancer, and it isn't. And they say, oh, I wish it was because it would just make the decision for me. But if you ask them if they were suicidal, they say no. Yeah. But but they are, and, they, and that is still really unwell. And I, what I would say is being able to hold down a job, be Billy Big Balls with all your mates and, and, and cracking all those jokes, it doesn't mean that you're not unwell. You know, you can do all that, you can go to the gym, but you might not be able to shower for five days because you just mentally can't get yourself there. Or you might not be able to get yourself to to eat dinner. You know, you can drive home, you can pull people out of a burning building, but you can't look after yourself because that's just the last thing and you don't have it. You don't have that energy in you. So, so assuming that, that someone, you know, a guy can recognize that, that they have got a real need there to reach out for support. So some of these things have been, have been happening, and and they do finally recognise in themselves that actually, you know what, I need, I do need to 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 do something. What is the first thing they should do? I mean, really, I would encourage them when they recognise to tell someone that they know, 
it, it's important, even if they're not expecting that other person to be the counsellor, but just say, I'm really struggling. If they've got a friend, you know, there are lots of avenues. And again, this is, this is the problem we're saying reach out, is that actually when they're unwell, a lot of the time, even if they do know where they want to go, it's exhausting having to wait for 40 minutes to get through to GP, which is why I say, if you can, do try and tell someone whether that is a family member, a friend, a colleague, a line manager, and ask them to call the GP. You'd be amazed at how many men I have called the GP practice and arranged their appointment, or they've said, my appointment's in two weeks, but I'm suicide and I've rang them back and said, you need a duty doctor to call them. And so it is important that we sign post, mm -hmm. but, but what I see in uniform services a lot is signpost and that makes it your job again. You've got something else to do before you can receive help. So what I would say is if you struggle to say it, write it down. If, for example, this conversation is too much for you, then write it on a notes app and, and you know screenshot it and send it to a mate who, who you think you might be able to talk to or send it in a WhatsApp to your wife, write it in a letter you know, there are many ways of talking and it doesn't have to be by opening your mouth. Uh, you can write it in an email. You know, a, a lot of GP practices these days, for example, and online forms such as Firefighters Charity, all these places will have online forms to refer yourself. So if it's easier, you can do that and they can call you. But this is why I always say that actually it's better to reach into the man rather than asking him to reach out because he's going to be terrified of reaching out but if if a man listening to this is struggling just remember that you don't have to say it verbally you can write it down or even if you get to the gp you can read out a script you can literally type out a script for yourself and say i need to read this and so you don't have that eye contact mm -hmm. you can just sit there read your phone and say this is how i'm feeling i really need help there, there are ways of talking that aren't so confrontational yeah, it's whatever works for you, isn't it? Whatever whatever that means and that method is for you, That's if, if it works and that's what you're comfortable with, then that's the way to go. Yeah. Absolutely. Tony, that's been fascinating. Thank you so much for, for your time. I've got to end by asking, what about, what about you? What's the, what does the future have in store for you? What are your, what are your hopes and ambitions for the, for the coming years? Grand plans. Oh, mm. okay. I think really I want to completely take off my touch therapy and really start that. I imagine men will be with most of my clients but i'd like to do it for everyone um whoever needs it i think certainly after covid many people are now touch starved and feeling very isolated so i would really like to start doing that i need to read more because i'm writing two books my next two books on men's mental health one will be in general workplaces and another one will be purely on uniform services uh, so i need to read more to write more <laughs> So I'm trying to write two books at the same time um, and I'm hoping to run my first men's mental health in uniform services event. So that will be either a half day or, or full day of talking about all the things and, and much more that, than you and I have discussed. But yeah, grand plans uh, awesome. to take over the world, I think. Awesome. <laughs> well, listen, just keep in touch and let us know all about them. We're happy to chat about them whenever those things Come on, whenever, whenever the books are published and whenever the, the event happens, let us know. We're happy to to shout about it. It sounds like sounds all like exactly what we what our listeners are going to want to hear about. So thank you so much. And I've got to end by asking you, you've got to tell us what, what hot chocolate do we all need to go out and buy now? What is the go-to hot chocolate? Oh no, now you're putting me on the spot. It's preference. It's preference. <laughs> okay, that's I, a guess out. Come on. It's gotta be. It's gotta I, be. I, I've got a velvetizer. So I have the hotel chocolate. You know, I'm a posh bitch. Um, <laughs> but I think add add whatever toppings you want. You know, funny enough, do you know who got me into fancy hot chocolates? Was an ex-military, and he he's done many difficult tours, and and he's now police working in quite a secure unit. And he's like six four, and I met him, and he was I was like, oh, I'm really intimidated. And he said, oh, I'll have a hot chocolate. And they said, oh, cream and marshmallows? And he said, yes. And after that, I've never stopped having hot chocolates. And the amount of men that will say to me, are you going to have a hot, fancy chocolate? 
and or it'll be I'll take you for a fancy hot chocolate when we meet. Um, <laughs> so I'm I'm slowly getting there. So maybe what I need to do is buy an old tour bus and then go on tour with a hot chocolate and hugs and a chat at the same time. <laughs> there you go. That's definitely a plan. I love that idea. Cool. Tony, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your evening. And uh, yeah, we'll take care and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Tim. That's it for another episode. Huge thanks to Tony White for such a fascinating insight into the inner workings of modern man and the things that hold us back when it comes to our mental health. If you'd like to know more about Tony and her work, all the links to her social profiles and her website are in the show notes. You'll also find our episode question there too. And this time we want to know, what does modern masculinity mean to you? Our yes, no poll meanwhile asks, have you ever used banter to mask your true feelings? Give us a yes or a no. You can answer both on the Spotify episode page, the link to which can be found in the episode notes, through the link to site in the show profile or the Brave Front website. As ever, you can also interact with the show by sending us a voice message. So tell us what you think of our guests and the subjects we're discussing. You can also tell us your ideas for topics and things you'd like us to cover too. Again, just head to the episode notes, the link to site or the Brave Front website for more details and the links to do so. And finally, if you've enjoyed the show, once again, please leave us a review and follow us on whatever platform you usually get your podcasts. In the meantime, though, look after yourselves and I'll see you soon. Take care.